I'd like to welcome everybody to our second in our series in um, the training for competency in cultural competency. I guess that's a little redundant. And what I'd like to do is just start us off uh, with sort of giving us all forgiveness for not knowing what we didn't know before we learned it. And today we are going to engage in upstander training. So when we originally talked about this, we called this bystander training. And when I started looking in the literature, sort of because of the whole issue of bullying, bystander has become a negative word. So a bystander is a person present but not involved, an onlooker, and an upstander is someone who speaks up and becomes involved. So what we wanna to do today is try to do allyship training or how to be an upstander. So you're gonna be someone who stands up, speaks out, takes action in defense of those targeted for harm and injustice. And it's not just on the people experiencing these issues to respond or address, it really is on all of us. So I'm hoping after today's novel Zoom training, we will be better at this. So our training partner today is Magali Fasciato. She's the Assistant Dean of Faculty Development and Diversity, and she directs the development and implementation of the programs in the School of Medicine's Office of Faculty Development. She's published very widely in the areas of diversity, unconscious bias, development, and organizational identity. And what we're going to do today is I'm going to turn the screen over to Dr. Fasciato, who's going to proceed with our presentation and training. We then have some volunteer panels who are going to go through and just work in real time since they've not seen these cases before. How would they respond if they were in the roles that they were in? We'll discuss after the panel has responded to the first case. We'll do the same thing with the second case and then we'll discuss after that. So Dr. Fasciato, could you take the screen and I'll stop sharing. And start. There you go. Hi, Thank you. everyone. Thank you, Dr. Ren. Thank you for inviting me here today. Um, our office has partnered really closely with Dr. Ren, Dr. Han, and several others in your department who are really leading the way to, to drive initiatives for change that will really stick. So I really applaud your efforts, and I'm happy to be part of the learning journey today. As Dr. Ren mentioned, we'll be talking about active bystander or upstander training. I'll be using the terms interchangeably. Um, and we're really gonna be providing a framework. So I'll provide some brief educational materials and then we'll jump in to hear about your experience and expertise. The framework I'm providing can be used across professional interactions, both colleague to colleague, as well as in patient care settings. The idea here is that we wanna provide a framework for response. I'm not gonna give you exact words. The way I would respond is different from the way you might respond. The point here, as Dr. Ren really mentioned, is that we need to respond. So I'm going to share my screen. Um, and I know several of you have had a bit of you know, training around, around bias, so I'm not gonna spend too much time on describing bias, but essentially bias influences everything that we do and see in our lives. It's a way for our brain to take cognitive shortcuts uh, to save time and energy. So our brain categorizes things into smaller buckets so that we don't have to think too hard. <laughs> this means that our biases are activated, particularly under conditions where our brain wants to save time and energy. So this can be when we're under stress, when we have time constraints, when we're multitasking, there's a need for closure. Essentially, you know, our biases can be activated all the time and particularly while we're at work. One way that our bias manifests is through what are called microaggressions. Microaggressions are everyday slights, snubs, and insults that are both intentional and unintentional that communicate hostile or offensive messages based on an individual's marginalized identity. The important point here is that it can be both intentional and unintentional. Uh, this may seem like it differs from explicit prejudice or discrimination, but actually what we're really focusing on here is the impact and microaggressions, the impact of microaggressions can really add up over time to really take a toll on physical and mental health. 
So this is a simple flow chart that tries to show this distinction between intent and impact. The way bias operates is that an individual may have a certain intent. So this could be trying to tell a joke, trying to find a commonality with someone, and they then enact a behavior. This behavior then has an impact on the target individual. The impact may have the intended consequences, but often with the case of uh, microaggressions, it will have unintended consequences on the, in, on the individual. And the important point here is that while intent is important, um, the urgent need is really to focus on the impact in all situations. So here are some examples of some microaggressions. I'm not gonna read through all of them. Um, I can give you these slides afterwards so you can use them as a toolkit, but I just wanna get at this distinction between intent and potential impact. When we say something like, where are you from? Where were you born? The intent may be one of curiosity, but it can signal to the target that you, know, you don't belong, you're an other, um, you're not like me. On, and on the flip side, when you say something like, when I look at you, I don't see color, the intent there may be to say, you know, we're all the same, let's be friends. But at the same time, it can send a message to the target that I don't really care about your, your background. Let's, let's leave that at the door. And this one we hear a lot when a patient speaks only to the man in the room or the white physician or the older appearing physician. On the side of the patient, the intent may be to try to get information from the person they perceive to have the most experience in the room. Um, but to the woman physician, the physician of color, or the younger appearing physician, it feels like, you know, I'm not going to be respected here. I, I shouldn't really be in this position. So I'm spending some time talking about microaggressions specifically. And, and as I mentioned, you know, this is because it's what we most commonly see. But we will witness outright discrimination and prejudice. And again, the framework that we're using is going to be very similar because of the impact that will be felt by the individual can be similar across these scenarios. So we've talked a little about what bias is, now we're gonna get into strategies to address bias. First, briefly, if you recognize that you have expressed bias in some way, or if uh, someone tells you that you have expressed bias in some way, I'm gonna assume it was unintentional. Uh, so what do you do? First, recognize that even though your intent might have been good, the impact felt may have been very different. So you wanna own your actions and simply apologize. I'm so sorry. I see that what I said was inappropriate. Uh, this can go a long way towards rebuilding and repairing relationships. You might also wanna use this moment for self-reflection to think about how you might stop that bias from, a, from presenting in the future. Now, for, for the meat of today, <laughs> um, as Dr. Ren mentioned, you know, you don't want to be a simple bystander. So that actually the, the phrase bystander effect describes a situation we don't want. And that's when you see something happening and you say, you know, I'm just an onlooker here. I'm going to let someone else take care of that. And, and that's not what we want here. And that's not what you've been trained as medical professionals to do. We really want to be active bystanders or upstanders. And the way you can be an active bystander varies depending on the context and depending on you as an individual as well. You can intervene directly. And this is addressing the situation as it occurs. One note here is that we say if you are in a position of power, we often recommend that you do intervene directly if possible. Because if you are the leader in the room and you let a racist comment slip by, it sends the message to everyone else in the room that that's okay and, and we don't want that. And so it's really important to, to try to, to stop that as soon as it occurs. If, if you, you don't feel comfortable um, addressing it directly or the context doesn't allow it, you can also follow up. And here you actually follow up with multiple people. You wanna follow up with the target of the, the bias and, and support them in whatever way you can to let them know that you recognize that it was not okay. Uh, it's good to follow up with the team to say that's not the behavior that we, we, we allow here so that the team knows that there's action being taken. And it's also good if possible to follow up with the offender, the person who made the biased remark to let them know about um, the impact their actions carried. So once you've decided to be an active bystander, uh, there are some things to consider around context. First, will intervening in the moment um, affect your safety or the safety of the target? You also want to consider power dynamics in the room. 
as a medical student, I may not feel as though I can step in myself, but that doesn't mean that I don't do not that I don't do anything. Um, I can actually find other mechanisms to make sure that something happens. In terms of self-preservation, what I mean here is that if you are the target of the bias, the harassment, the microaggression, it is not your responsibility to, to educate anyone or to step in. If you feel comfortable doing so, please do, more power to you, but it is not your responsibility and it is not your job. And finally, specific to patient care, uh, you really want to understand how sick is the patient, is there time to address this in the moment right now? And as I mentioned with patient care, we can use these same frameworks and just think through a couple of additional factors. And then finally, if you're, you, you're unable to address the comment, um, you, you quickly want to bring it to the attention of others on the team or to hospital leadership or department leaderships to make sure that the incident is addressed as quickly as possible. Now, the goal of addressing bias in all situations is first to support the target. And this is just so important. I've heard of several instances where people come to us as a target of a discriminatory remark here at Stanford and they'll say, you know, it hurt that person X said that. But the worst part was that there were three other people in the room and no one said anything. And so that's why we really wanna focus on supporting the target and being that upstander. You wanna bring attention to the problem and if possible, bring awareness to the offender. If you know, what was said was, was unintentional, you want to make the offender aware of the impact their words carried. If it was intentional, you wanna send the message that that type of behavior is not tolerated. So here's a, a simple initial framework that you can think through. First, erase. <laughs> you wanna expect that bias events will occur. Um, you will then want to notice or recognize the mistreatment. And this is actually harder than it sounds. If you don't share the same identity, background, or past experiences as someone else, you may not recognize how actions or words may land on that individual. And so this is a continual learning process to really be able to recognize bias and harassment as it occurs. And then you address the situation in real time. As we mentioned, we support the target. And then finally, here is where we might involve a team debrief so that the entire team comes together to think about how to establish and encourage a positive culture moving forward, and if possible, to think about how we might prevent recurrence of such behavior. So here is the, the fun part where we get some quotes if you're interested in that. What are some ways to apply these upstander strategies, particularly in the moment directly? You can use humor. Humor is nice because it is not confrontational. It can feel a little less confrontational. The caveat here is that you don't want to use humor to minimize really egregious behavior, but it can be nice in certain situations. You can be literal. This really exposes you know, unspoken assumptions and shows that they, they really don't make sense. Direct communication is always useful using we or I statements or expressing your reaction to what occurred. You know, we treat every patient here with respect and we expect to be treated the same way. You can ask questions. Um, questions are great because they allow for self-reflection. Simply by asking for someone to repeat what they said or, you know, what did you mean by that? Means that they might, they'll actually have to repeat it and say, ooh, you know, that didn't come out how I thought it came out. <laughs> and then finally, I, I really like the, this last one about stating discomfort. Uh, this can serve as a speed bump in the conversation and it allows others the opportunity to chime in as well. So you can see, you know, that comment made me really uncomfortable and someone else can jump in and say, you know, it made me uncomfortable too. So th those are some, some a broad framework of how you might address things in the moment. Now, as we mentioned, you know, if you cannot address things in the moment, you want to follow up and here are some strategies for following up. In certain instances, you may want to remove the target from the situation if you think there's a lot of emotional harm that's been done or if safety is in, is in question. So, Mr. King, I'm gonna have Dr. Target assist with another patient right now. You can also private, provide support privately to the target of the behavior. You know, I thought what he said was unacceptable. How are you? How can I help? And then you wanna express disapproval of the behavior if possible to the offender in a private setting. So, I was disappointed to hear you say that. 
Now, I want to end here just by talking a little bit about discrimination from patients directly because that can be a big part of, of your daily lives here. Uh, this was a survey that was done through WebMD in 2017 of different healthcare professionals asking about their bias experiences. And what you'll notice here is that over half of MDs, RNs, NPs, and PAs had experienced offensive remarks from patients. And it really runs the gamut it, from, you know, from age to national origin to religion to accent. Really nothing seems like it's off limits in these situations. And I'm not showing this chart to say that this behavior is normalized and therefore okay. This is actually trying to say the opposite, that this is not okay and we really need to figure out ways to address this um, in every situation. So this is an article, this is taken from an article that was written by our colleagues in the Department of Pediatrics in 2016. And it followed an instance of religious discrimination where a patient's family didn't want a resident uh, taking care of their child because that resident was from a specific religion. And the uh, pediatric education researchers who, who approached this decided they wanna approach this to figure out how to create and foster a, an inclusive and safe learning environment for trainees, and I would argue anyone else on the team, in the face of discrimination. And so they came up with four steps. The first we had, we've discussed briefly, and that's uh, assessing illness acuity. You know, can we transfer the patient? Is there time to deal with this right now? Um, the second is to really focus everyone's attention on the patient's health and how everyone in the room is really there to make sure that the patient gets better. And it's always appropriate to educate the patient or their family on team structure. You know, in a teaching facility, we all need to play a part. This is the hardest, but you, you wanna depersonalize the event if possible. So bias, we have to recognize that bias is often motivated by fear of the unknown and not motivated by any specific individual. And so for this, you could actually name the behavior and say, you know, are you discriminating against this physician because of their religion? And then finally, you wanna create this supportive structure both for trainees or for anyone else on the team to cope with the discrimination. And here's an important part, point that, you know, if possible, um, if, it's, if it's possible in this situation, you wanna empower the team member to decide for themselves if they'd like to continue taking care of the patient, if that's an option. Um, or if it's an option, empower the trainee to decide or the other team member to decide if they want to remove themselves from that patient care. Um, it's up to them and no one has to make that decision. No one should be making that decision for them. So I'm going to end our brief educational segment uh, really by saying, you know, after all instances of bias, you really want to continue the conversation. We have to offer support to those who may have been directly affected. Uh, consider how you could stop recurrence of the event and really be on the lookout for bias, uh, be a consistent champion against it, and, and really focus on um, how you can stay educated on recognizing bias as it occurs and to how to really be this upstander in the situation.